During my years as a garden designer, I've enjoyed helping homeowners create private sanctuaries full of beauty and wonder. I find each garden to be a fresh opportunity to explore and create uniquely personal spaces. These are just a few of the gardens I've helped transform into garden homes. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. Have you ever seen such color in your life? Well, welcome to The Garden Home, a show about blurring the lines between inside and out. A show about design, making beautiful outdoor living spaces. And today, we're going to focus on, guess what? Color, lots of color. Who doesn't love color? But we're going to focus on color from summer bulbs. And that's what you see here in this gorgeous display. We're also going to visit the Chicago Botanic Gardens. This place is full of color. Plus, we're also going to check out a daylily farm in North Arkansas. Plus, I'll show you how to assemble this beautiful gift with orchids. And I've got a project for you, too, so let's get started. Come on. Just look at the size of these glads. Have you ever seen anything so spectacular? And what gorgeous color. Well, I'm in an absolutely charming garden in the Willamette Valley in Oregon. This garden is fraught with beauty. Lots of perennials, but more than that, so many summer bulbs, you just cannot believe it. Lilies, dahlias, gladioli, and these spectacular crocosmias from South Africa. Well, I had the good fortune to walk around this garden and learn more about it from its creator, Ray Fordyce. Ray, this is such a beautiful garden. What was your inspiration? Thank you. Uh, in fact, when I was in college, I would walk past a beautiful garden every day that had been designed by a couple of landscape architect ladies in the 1930s, and they designed several significant gardens in the area. Were they laden with summer flowering bulbs like this one is? <laughs> no, like most Oregon gardens, it was a spring garden primarily. I see. A lot of things bloom here in the spring, and it's very easy to have an excellent garden but the weather is pretty terrible here in the springtime and it's beautiful all summer long. Well, you have certainly ushered bloom into the full summer here. Right. Yeah, right. the bulbs, I mean, I look around, I see those gorgeous crocosmias and lilies and dahlias all in flower. Yes, the purpose is something that can give you color in your garden with very little effort. And most of these bulbs are just about indestructible. They continue to multiply and produce more flower every year. I mean, it's, it's just a matter of getting them in the ground and giving them you know, for the most part, full sun, depending yes. on what you choose. I mean, certainly what you have here is a full sun garden. And just fertilize them and take care of them in a general sort of way, and they're really easy. Yes, they're easy to live with. In fact, in this garden, I do have very rich soil. And so most of what I have grows to enormous height, which I really hadn't planned. <laughs> Nonetheless, it makes it pretty impressive. Well, I'm sure you're asked this a lot because I am. What's your favorite flowering bulb this time of year? Uh, of course, these, the, the hybrid Asiatic lilies. It has a blackberry-colored center with a cream edge. Mm. Well, even, even its architectural form without yes. the blooms being fully colored and open mm -hmm. is really quite handsome. Yes. Most of the lilies, in fact, that people are planting, like Stargazer and Casablanca, these are cut flowers, whereas what I've looked for is long bloom season. So among dahlias, do you have a favorite? I mean, like, like the really you know, dark ones, or maybe it's the cactus-flowered ones. What I'm looking for in the dahlias, there are a lot of different dahlia growers in this area. In fact, I think America's largest dahlia grower is just a few miles up the road. So you can buy a lot of dahlias anywhere. What I'm looking for in dahlias is something that's going to look good in a mixed setting. Typically, when people I find have dahlias, they'll grow one of each mm -hmm. in a row. Right. So actually, dahlias that have less showy blossoms, where there's a lot of green foliage, good structure, and works well in a mixed garden setting. Really more of a landscape dahlia, if you will, yes. than one that's than for show, show or dahlia. cutting. Right. I am so taken away with what I found out here in what seems like the, the middle of Oregon, among all these beautiful fields of grain, this, this gem. <laughs> Just look at the intense color in this variety of gladiolus. It's really spectacular. You know, glads, as they're often called, have been grown in gardens for some time. I mean, they're really considered old fashioned, but they've made a recent comeback. People are enjoying them again, and they're great for cut flowers. But look at them in the garden. They provide this 
really bold verticality and a beautiful contrast to other flowers like the dahlia you see in this particular flower border. This particular shade of pink harmonizes beautifully with other flowers such as phlox, lilies, and old-fashioned roses. Now take a look at this combination. Look at these gorgeous maroon glads contrasted with these beautiful, exquisite, and sweet-smelling oriental lilies. Aren't they stunning? And then over here we have plume poppy coming up, which is a, well, it can be a rather thuggish perennial. But combined, I think this combination really sings. Now, what I like about the way these are planted is there's about 20 bulbs planted here in a group, so you get this nice bold effect. You see, it pays to be generous when planting glads. And what I like to do is plant a crop, if you will, um, and then plant another one two weeks later, and then another one two weeks later, and then you have plenty blooming in the garden, as well as plenty to bring inside the house. One of my favorite cities to visit is Chicago. I think one of the reasons is it's so green and there's so many things to do. I like to make it a point to visit the Chicago Botanic Garden whenever I'm in town, and last summer was no exception. Director Chris Jarantoski talked to me about the overall layout of the gardens. You know, what is there not to love about annuals when they look like this? Well, this is a circle garden, and this is one of the areas where the Botanic Garden does feature annuals in a backbone of evergreens and we change this out every spring, every summer, and then we tweak it for fall. So it's a real changeable, very colorful garden. Well, it has to be one of the most popular areas, although relative to the larger garden and all the other gardens here, it's relatively small. It's very popular. We have two secret gardens in this garden also that people love to visit. So it's right up there with the Japanese garden and English wall garden. Now, do you have a favorite space out here? No. <laughs> it's like, what's your favorite they're, kid? They're I mean, all, your, all your children. They're all great. Depends on the time of year, too. You know, the Rose Gardens peak from June on. You know, the Japanese garden, great in winter. It keeps changing all the time. It seems like you all have something going on out here in every season. Well, we do. The garden changes drastically from season to season, and we're open 365 days a year. And the greenhouses are great January, February, March. Now, Chris, you've, you've seen this garden grow over the years. What is it that makes you the most excited about about being here? I think it's watching the interaction of plants and people, seeing people enjoy it. And one of the things that Chicago Botanic Garden believes is that beautiful gardens and natural areas are important to the physical and mental well-being of people. We think that uh, people taking care of gardens, creating gardens and maintaining them it leads to a better life, a more satisfying life. And you can see it in their visitors. A beauty makes a difference. They love it. And there's so many different garden experiences here. I mean, I, I, it's hard for me to figure out which one is my favorite. Correct. We have 24 different display gardens, four natural areas. We have a good master site plan, which really ties everything together with a certain vocabulary of materials. Well, I have to say that I'm taken away by one of your newest features, and that's the rooftop garden in the new science center. Well, rooftop gardens or green roofs are very popular now, and Chicago is really well known for that. And so, uh, like our other display gardens, we want to show a good example, but also it's, it's an evaluation garden. So we're not only showing a great example of a green roof, we're evaluating plants to expand the palette of plants that can be used on green roofs. You know, there really is something here for everyone. The, the more recent high-tech green roof all the way to uh, growing your own food. Well, we're kind of an entrance to the entire plant world. And as you mentioned, growing your own food is popular now. The locavore movement, the organic gardening movement. So we have four acres of nothing but edible plants for the public. If you're interested in cultural landscapes, the Japanese garden, the English wall garden. So we have something for everybody, really. Whether you just want to walk around with friends and family and enjoy a great site, or whether you're a serious student of bonsai or horticultural therapy or conservation biology, it's all here. Well, keep up the great work. Thanks a lot. I don't know about you, but I love color, and I love to bring it into the house. That's what I'm doing here. I just cut these hydrangeas this morning. Now, this is important, particularly this time of year when it's really heating up outside. You want to make sure that you cut them in the early morning. 
they remain hydrated that way. And you want to get them in clear water as quickly as possible. And that's what I've done. You know, a mantle can serve as a focal point in a room. And that's what we have here. And I change this mantle out with the seasons, just like I do many aspects of the room. But let's focus just on the mantle, because when people come into the room, they look for a focal point. It's a reference point that allows them to begin to sort of take in the context of the room. So here, what I have is a large antique French mirror that serves as the base. And then I've just simply leaned some other art up against that mirror. It's punctuated with this Wedgwood uh, black basalt bust of Cicero. I've got an, an old piece of sculpture here, which is bronze, which sort of echoes the dark colors of Cicero. And then to illuminate, what I've done is I've added just three of these votives, which have a really nice sort of ochre color to them. Now, I've accented either side of this with hydrangeas. These vases, if you will, uh, were very inexpensive. I got them at a discount store, but they've come in handy up here in this mantle because they're the perfect size. Now, I've used this color here because we've changed out the room for spring. And this color of pink, I think, works very well in the room. But it dominates this side of the room, and I feel like that we need to have balance. So over here by the dining table, you can see I have a very simple display. The centerpiece and the most colorful aspect of it is the hydrangea arrangement. Again, I just took hydrangeas that were cut at the back of the house and arranged them here and put them in an, an old porcelain tureen and set it on a silver tray, then flanked by a pair of candlesticks with hurricane shades over them, and then flanking those out to the length of the table you see a pair of reticulated compotes filled with Granny Smith apples. So these colors reflect the colors on the mantle as well as the pillows and some of the other accents in the room. What's great about using hydrangeas and apples, as you see here, is they can last a long time. One last tip, when you create an arrangement like this to really show the flowers off, make sure a few of the leaves stick out because that contrast adds more visual interest. It's great fun to be able to go out into the back garden, bring things from outside, indoors, and enjoy them in both places. Whenever I step out to a party or a gathering, I always like to take the hostess or a host something special. And it shouldn't be any surprise to you that I like it to come from the garden, like this gorgeous orchid. Now, you can give the traditional bottle of wine, but that usually doesn't last very long. Unlike these orchids, well, they'll bloom for months and months to come. You see, this is really easy to assemble. You just place an orchid in any container you like and make sure that you have a plastic liner. Cut a couple of fantail pussy willow stems or some other type of stem and place it in the container near the stem of the orchids. Now go ahead and remove the original supports for the stems, but use the original clips to secure the stems of the orchid to the pussy willow branch. Next, cut a few strips of raffia and tie the orchid stems to the pussy willow, and then remove the clips. The pussy willow serves as a decoration and a support for the orchids. Now cover the base of the container with moss, then place it in the center of some tissue paper gathering some of the paper around the container. Then use a rubber band to wrap around the outside to keep the paper in place. Now with this distinctive gift, it'll ensure that you get an invitation back and then some. This long row of white flowering plants is buckwheat. Now it's been grown in this country since colonial times and it has all sorts of benefits. It's amazing, really. It'll germinate in three to five days. It grows in really dry areas. Um, it's a great green manure in that I could turn this under into the soil and it would improve the soil quality. The blooms are edible and it makes a flower, the seed, that is gluten-free. And you may know buckwheat pancakes. This is what it comes from. Or noodles made from buckwheat. But one of the reasons that I have it here is because it's a part of our beneficial insect program. You see, it also attracts the insects that I want in this garden. And it will also lure away some of the insects I don't want over there in the big garden. For instance, aphids love it. So if I can get the aphids to move over here to the buckwheat, 
that's a better deal. Get them off my beans, onto the buckwheat, that's what I want. And we have another area out here in the garden that serves as an insectary, and it works hand in hand with the buckwheat. That's planted with all kinds of colorful flowers. There's cosmos and zinnias and marigolds and fennel and dill and so forth in this garden, as well as some sunflowers. And if you just stand there and look at it, you can see that it's a hub of activity all day long. Now, carrying on with this theme of beneficials, I want to talk to you about these lace wings that I just ordered. You see, they come in a little cup like this, and they're tiny little green eggs. And what I've planned to do is sprinkle those eggs throughout this band of buckwheat, because the aphids that are here will serve as a food source for the babies when they hatch. But within just three weeks, they will grow to about a half an inch long and they will live up to their reputation as being aphid lions. They have such a voracious appetite for aphids, it's rather astonishing. And it doesn't stop there. They also are great at hunting down red spider mites and mealybugs. You may be wondering, where on earth would one buy lacewing eggs? Well, you can order them online. You can have them sent directly to your home. Now, if you're raising beneficial insects, it makes a lot of sense that you wouldn't use insecticide because you'll not only kill the bad bugs, but you're gonna kill all of these good bugs as well. Just think, all of these little eggs will be scattered among here. The hatchlings will emerge. This will create a nursery among the buckwheat. And soon, they'll be over there in the big garden helping me take care of those pests before they get to my vegetables. <music> I can think of few plants that are as easy to grow as the daylily and as showy in summer. When gardeners ask me to recommend a no-fail perennial, well, the daylily is always at the top of my list. Harry and Dorothy Rowland in Penguin, Arkansas show us their impressive display of daylilies. Our daughter up in uh, Minnesota, she lived up there at the time and had a, uh, a little flower shop and she got into daylilies. So she gave us a bunch of them. It just kind of snowballed from there. Then we found out that there was a, a daylily club and we got a hold of those people and we joined that club. And then we joined the uh, American Hermocallus Society. And from uh, that, you get catalogs. This is a whole bed of spiders. This one's Lorena and Gadsden's Lady. I think it was about 15 years ago when we started. We have 1,100 varieties. We have a great variety of old ones, fairly new ones. In fact, we probably have more of the older varieties than most people, at least around in this area. I have different favorites in all the colors. I don't dislike any of them. We've got uh, a new one out there that's called Priscilla's Smile. That's a, that's a really a nice one. It's a, it's a pretty new one. Join a local daylily society because you learn so much from the other people who grow daylilies. And our daylily society that we belong to um, has programs all the time. And then we have a time when we talk about if something is bothering our daylilies, like daylily rust or some particular insect, we all talk it over and say what we would do with it, and we get good tips from other growers, so it helps a new person learn. We just enjoy people from all over uh, that can come and see, and hopefully that we get people interested in growing daylilies, and uh, so they can keep on getting more and more and get in trouble like we are. <laughs> We've been getting some really exciting design projects here in the studio and some great photographs that you guys are sending to me for us to take a look at and come up with ways to improve the look. Now today we've got a house in Florida from Lee. And you can see it's a very beautiful house, classical. Uh, the proportions are really very good and it's, it's symmetrical. 
So why don't we get started with just a few ideas for framing this and then we'll move into color because Lee is very interested in color and she mentions it gets really hot in Tampa. So why don't we start with just a few ideas. I think Lee what I would do here is paint the color of this fence over here a dark green so it sort of goes away. And then um, I think in terms of artifact if we wanted to add something uh, a pair of plinths here, low plinths with a classical sort of urn in them uh, where you could do some color in there would be really nice. From a planting standpoint, I would keep the balance going here. You have this live oak tree here. I would prune the lower limbs off and get it where at least you can walk under it. So you want to begin to train it where it will come up uh, above the sidewalk where you can easily walk. And I would come over here at the same point and add another one of those live oaks here to begin to frame this. You see where we're going? And then what I would do is use camellias because they do so well for you and they're so beautiful for winter bloomers. And I would put a camellia here and maybe even one between these two palms. And I would come over here to this side and anchor this side of the house with some camellias there because we're just trying to frame this. And then I'd like for you to think about using sort of a round shrub, a boxwood, you could use Buxus microphylla, wintergreen, which would do well in your part of the world. Maybe one there, one here. We'd punctuate just behind the step there with one, and then one back here as well, and right here at this point, and one right here at this point. And then in between, what I would do is divide this bed where the back planting all along the foundation is planted in holly fern. So for about a foot out from the foundation, you would have holly fern that would grow up only about 14 to 16 inches tall. It would be evergreen. And then, Lee, what we would do right here in front is this would be all dug up as a bed for you to plant seasonal color. And for the winter, you could plant pansies. You'd plant them in the fall. In Florida, you would begin planting them in October and they would bloom all the way, well, really right up until May and you would take them out or you could even do impatience. That's the wonderful thing about Florida. And think about this in all pale pink impatience. Then think about uh, for summer changing that out to lantana so it will really take the heat and use one of those really floriferous types such as a pale yellow one that I've used for years. And so that pale yellow with the white and green for summer would be really, really cool. And in these urns, you could do holly ferns in these urns and just keep it really simple. Beautiful home. I hope these ideas are helpful to you. these dahlias. Aren't they spectacular? And what a rich color. Well, this is all the time we have for today's show. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. And just remember, some of these summer bulbs, they're a great way to add a burst of color into your flower borders or even containers. Until next time, from the Garden Home, I'm Alan Smith. More information about today's topic and other topics covered in this series can be found at plnsmith.com. 